Okay gang, let's take a look at the process for doing a paired mean t-test. Uh, at the beginning of the chapter, we had that worksheet where we looked at, uh, where we read setups for problems and decided are these data sets paired or are they independent? And in examples two and three, we handled how to, hand, uh, how to run a, a two sample t-test when your samples are independent. Now we're gonna talk about what it means when they're paired. How do you handle a hypothesis test when you have two data sets that are related to one another, right? You're getting two measurements from one person. So what do we do there? Now, before I get into the nitty gritty of all of this stuff, I just want you to know that when you run a paired test, it's going to have the exact same mechanics as the hypothesis test we did in chapter nine. And chapter nine might feel like it was a long ways away, you know, like, oh my goodness, what are you talking about? So let me just remind you what we did in chapter nine before I get into the newer stuff. So when we were in chapter nine and we were running a hypothesis test, right, you had mu equal to some number, right? We called it the null mean, right? So you would have, we did an example where we were talking about a CEO and how much time her employees were spending on, on the internet, basically on compute, on personal use of company technology. And we have mu equal to 75. Right, so we, in, in chapter nine, we had mu on this side and a number on this side, All right? And then this was our test statistic, right? X bar minus mu, S over square root N. We had these assumptions here, right? A random sample, how do I get normality? What was the sample standard deviation? And if you remember on your calculator, we had stat test two, right? We either had the data or the statistics plugged in what we want, calculated or drew, called it a day. So that was the mechanics coming out of chapter nine. And I'm gonna refer back to this, even right now when we run this paired test, because this is the blueprint for how we're gonna run these. All right, but the little caveat, the little tweak on this will be this subscript of D. So if you look at the null, right, we're back to having just one parameter in the null and it's equal to a number. And that was different from our previous nulls in this chapter, right? In the first two examples, we were doing mu sub one equaling mu sub two, or I should say technically the second and third example in this chapter. But we had two parameters we were defining when we had two independent means. When you have paired means, you only have the one parameter and you have that subscriptive D there, and that D stands for difference. We're gonna be looking at differences in the two data sets. So we're gonna be subtracting some stuff. So when you see that subscriptive D, the D is standing for difference, and it's our way of notating that we're looking at paired tests. So when we see this subscript, everyone in stats is like, okay, we've got paired, paired means we're gonna look at, paired data. All right, so we've got mu sub d equaling a number. Our test statistic also has all these subscripts of d. So we're gonna look at the average, the average from the sample, at least the difference average, right? And then we're gonna look at the mean, uh, the parameter difference the sample standard deviation of the difference is and divided by the square root of n. You see degrees of freedom, it's not that ugly formula anymore. We're back to n minus one. All right, we're gonna get p-values the same way, little tcdf, right? You'll have a greater than, less than, or not equals to alternate. So right-tailed, left-tailed, or two-tailed. The assumptions are different though from one sample mean hypothesis testing because we do actually have two data sets, just they're paired. So you see me bolding the word difference all throughout here because that's the key distinction in terms of a chapter nine hypothesis test and a paired mean test in chapter 10. All right, there's a lot of similarities, but this difference is a big, I hate to say it, is a big difference between the two. Maybe that's not as funny to you, but moving on. All right, so the sample size, right? Whatever your different sample size is, you're gonna have Potentially, a lot of common times, like maybe you'd have a before and after. So you'd have your first data set and your second data set, right? And they should have the same number of observations in each set. And we're going to take differences. And those n differences should be from a random sample, right? Or a sample that represents your population, right? We want to take note that the pairs, excuse me, the samples are paired. Or you could say the samples are matched. And some people even say the samples are match paired. Pick one. I'm probably gonna write paired. I don't know, it's a Wednesday night. Maybe I'll write matched, who knows. Um, and then for normality, right? The differences, right? The number of differences is large. And again, the central limit theorem says they have to be 30 or higher, 
right? Or the population distribution for the differences, ooh, that should have been bolded, um, is approximately normal. Or the graph of the differences shows plausible normality. All right, so we've got a bunch of differences floating through here. All right, and then S sub D, right, the standard deviation off of the difference to data is known. All right, and as we start to go through this, common pairings that you're gonna, you're gonna read about or, or that pop up often enough in statistics, the most common of the paired data setups is the before and after. That is one of the more common ones where one person gets both treatments. So before and after, all right, very common pairings. Anytime you see a before and after, it's gonna be paired. Twins, oh, statisticians love twins. We love to test genetic things, I know that's a technical term, things on twins because they have the same DNA. So with those twins, we'll give one twin a treatment, second twin, maybe the placebo or an alternate treatment. We love to, comparing to, we love to compare those two um, data sets. Um, the same object getting two treatments. So let me give you, I'm gonna do my best drawing of a lawn. This is a patch of grass, right? Ooh, very good drawing. So what, some, what we do sometimes is, let's say we want to test out a fertilizer, right? So we'll cut this patch of grass in half and we'll put fertilizer A here. Fertilizer, I can spell. Fertilizer A here and fertilizer B here. And since we're taking one patch of grass, or like one observation and we're getting two measurements from it, that would be paired data. Um, I think in a previous example, I can't remember if it was example two or three, I think it was example two. Um, we, had a, we had an example where we had floor waxes, right? So in that example, I think they said they had 35 floors, whoops, that got wax A, right? And then we had a different 35 floors that got wax B, right? That was the setup in that example. And these were two independent um, sets, right? Because this was a set of 35 floors, this was a different set of 35 floors. If you had wanted to pair it, if you, if you had the time and money, you don't need the second half of the 35 floors or the second set. What you could have done is taken your original 35 floors and then just cut them in half, right? Maybe down the middle, and you give this half, oops, not floor A, you gave this half wax A and this half wax B, Right? And then you could compare those two data sets. And since it was one floor giving you two measurements, again, paired data. That's just a different way to run that experiment. Okay? And we've mentioned standard error before, but now that we're in two sample land, I really want to make sure we're, we're hearing it. So the standard error is the standard deviation of your statistic. It's basically the denominator in step 10. Right? So this was two sample proportion z's, this was two sample independent mean t's, and here's paired mean t's. All right. So with that, we're going to flip the page and we're going to take a look at our first paired mean t-test. All right guys, so let's take a look at this problem. I'm going to read through it. And like always, let's be on the listen for what is the variable in this problem. So it says a college football coach was interested in whether the college's strength development class increased his player's maximum lift in pounds on the bench press exercise. He asked four of his players to participate in a study. The amount of weight they could each lift was recorded before they took the strength development class. After completing the class, the amount of weight they could each lift was again measured. The data are as follows. Okay, so I see the amount of weight they lifted prior to the strength and conditioning class and the amount of weight they lifted after the strength and conditioning class, or it just says strength development, excuse me. So the coach wants to know if the strength development class makes his player stronger on average. Test the appropriate hypotheses at a significance level of 0.01. Okay, well, let's see, let's see what we got here. So first of all, I hear average. I think that's a good one to point out. I saw the units here in pounds. So those two things right away are telling me I'm in mean land. And also right away, I noticed two different sets of data, right? This was a set of measurements before and a set of measurements after. So I just want to take note of that. I had two sets of data. 
So the next thing I have to ask myself is if, if I've got two sets, I've got to figure out are these independent or are they paired? Well, let's see. Does the amount of weight a person lifts before a strength development class have any bearing on what they'll lift after? And the answer is yes, right? I mean, even though I'd like to think of myself as wicked strong, right? There's a limit to what I can do compared to like a football player. I was thinking of a professional football player, like a Raider, right? So the amount of weight I can lift before will have a bearing on what I can lift after, even if this strength development class helps me. I mean, I'm not going to go from benching 85 to 200, right? There, there's just no way I'm going to make that leap. But a player that starts out at 300 might jump to 350, right? So, so these, these sets of data are definitely paired. All right. So once I know they're paired, I'm going to be using that t-test. All right. And we've done t-tests before. But I want to stress here that what we're going to look for is the differenced data. All right, so we're gonna get this data in our lists, and what we want to do is create a difference in this data. And you get to decide if you wanna go before, minus after, or after, minus before. And, and I'll show you what I mean by that in just a moment, okay? But the first thing I wanna do, I do wanna define step one, and then we'll go to our calculators and input some data. So in step one, since they're paired, you're gonna be defining mu sub d. We only have to define one parameter when they're paired because we're going to use all the mechanics we did in chapter 9. It's just that we're going to have mu sub d because we're taking a look at differences. So this will be true average and then difference, right? That's what that d represents, true average difference in amount of weight lifted. That is what's varying amongst us are our football players. So an amount of weight lifted and I'm gonna to opt to go after minus before. You could go before minus after but I like to go after minus before. It's just a personal preference and if I'm going after minus before if I'm this football coach I'm hoping this number is positive because if this difference was positive, it would mean this number was larger than this number. So that that strength and conditioning class, excuse me, strength development class was working. All right, so let's go to our lists and put our data into our lists. All right, so I'm gonna go into my lists. If I have any data in there, I'll clear it out. I don't, okay, that's fine. So let me do two, oops, 205. Let's put the data into our list. And make sure you put the before into one list and the after into one list. All right, so here's what you have to do when you have paired data. And you will have to do this. The calculator won't do it for you. Go over to L3, all right, and use your calculator like a spreadsheet. And let's make sure that we subtract these two data sets, right? Because that's what that subscriptive D stands for. You need to look at the difference data. And I'm personally going to go after minus before, so that's going to be L2 minus L1. And I'll hit enter in a moment and it will auto-populate, but just take note that I'm up in the definition of L3. I'm not here down in the first cell, I'm up in L3. When I hit enter, okay, let's see what's going on. So it looks like for this first player, it really worked, right? This first player was able to lift 90 pounds more after they took this strength development class. It looks like it also worked for this player this player wasn't allowed, not wasn't allowed, wasn't able to lift that much more, but 11 pounds is 11 pounds. And then for these two players, it looks like they could actually lift less after they, they took this strength development class. So in terms of if I'm going to reject or fail to reject the null, do I think the difference is something other than zero? Well, maybe. It's hard to say. Okay, but before we decide if we're going to reject or fail to reject the null, let's take a look at it. All right. So here we go. I'm going to move this up so that I'm taking a look at that day. I've got my data in there. All right, so let's do H naught and then step three, obviously, H sub A. All right, so we got mu sub D. So you're going to assume that the strength development class doesn't work. And, it, and if it doesn't work, that difference would be zero. Okay, so we're not going to assume the strength development class is working. The coach bears the burden of proof. He or she 
has to figure out, actually it says his here. So he has to figure out, he has to prove that this strength development class is working. We're just gonna assume it's not until he can prove otherwise. All right, so then let's see what the slant would be. The coach wants to know if the strength development class makes his players stronger. So if it's making them stronger, then this difference would be positive. All right, and we did see for two of the players, the difference was positive. If you wanted units on this, and I know we haven't done that in a little while, but it would be pounds. Okay, so if the strength and development class isn't working, which we're gonna assume it's not working, the coach doesn't get to just run this, he's gotta prove it's working, then the difference would be zero. If it is working, then the difference would be positive, or it would technically be greater than zero. All right, so we got that. It looks like I did give you an alpha, right? I set alpha to 1%. Okay. Now let's check the assumptions here. All right, so let's go through, did we have a random sample? And even though it's out of view, if you look back up at these words, there was nothing about being a random sample. And it actually says the opposite. It says the coach asked four of his players. All right, so this was not a random sample, it was actually selected by whatever means the, the college football coach wanted to do it, but it's not random, okay? So there might be some bias in it. We don't know. It's not a deal breaker, but it's just something to take note of. All right, for our second assumption, let's head back to the new part of this, right? You need to now tell me that the samples are paired or that the data was paired. And in this case, it is paired data, right? So I'm gonna say these are paired data sets. Okay. For normality, if we're taking a look at normality, right, my sample size isn't 30. There's nothing in that problem about the um, population of differences being normal. And that's going to leave us with the third option, making that graph. So let's take a look at how we would make that graph. Now, again, when you're dealing with difference data, once you get your initial two data sets in and you create that list of differences, for all you care, L3 is the only thing in your world right now. So all I care about is making a graph of the differenced data. Everything in paired land is about the differenced data. I can make a box plot, and, and I will, but I want you to see, or I want you to hear that the box plot's gonna be a little funky, because keep in mind when we were making box plots, you need five numbers for it, right? You need the five number summary, the min, max, Q1, Q3, and the median. Well, I only have four numbers, so one of those is gonna have to be a repeat. And so I just want you to hear that it's okay, we're gonna have a funky looking box plot and that's totally expected. Now I haven't made a box plot in a little while, let me go here. It looks like all of my plots are off, but it looks like plot one is ready to go with one exception. I can see it's a modified box plot, which is great but it's plotting L1's data. So let me go edit that to L3. All right, and let's hit zoom nine. And where's my funky looking box plot? Ooh, it's taking its time. Did I not turn it on? Huh, that's good, I didn't turn it on. So let me go ahead and turn it on. Yeah, I saw it graphing something. Something was still in my Y1. All right, now let me get my box plot. There it is. Okay, so again, this is the graph of the difference to data. If I trace it, it looks like my min and Q1 are the same number. They were both negative eight, okay? And then we get the median, then we get Q3, then we get the max. But let me go ahead and draw this out. Ultimately, my box plot, yes, it's skewed right, but there are no outliers. And it's when there's outliers that I'm gonna stop the problem. So box plot was skewed right, but no outliers. So I'm gonna move forward with this, right? I have an extremely small sample and that's okay. We're just gonna have a very, a, a much larger uh, uh, p-value because we're dealing with so few degrees of freedom. Okay, so let's take a look um, option four, or excuse me, assumption four, I should say, is do we know the sample standard deviation? Now, you could get that by running one bar stats off of L3. But as I've been trying to stress, we should use our calculator output screen 
to inform our write-up. So I'm gonna just put a little pin in that for right now. So I don't have SMD. If I wanted to, I could directly get it by, again, one bar stats L3, but I'm gonna wait on that. All right, in terms of the distribution, I'm on the T distribution. All right, now, in terms of the name, this is a little bit different. We will call this a paired mean t-test. So a paired mean t-hypothesis test. So where normally we say how many samples we have, when you have a paired test, you actually just write paired mean, not one sample mean or two sample mean, paired mean. All right, for degrees of freedom, this goes back to sample size minus one. Right, we're back with everything we did in chapter nine. Well, I had four players, so I have three degrees of freedom. Okay, so then let me move this up and we're gonna get into step nine. We're gonna make that test statistic, all right? And step 10, where we plug in our numbers. So I know my test statistic is gonna be a mean or a statistic minus a parameter over a standard error. All right, and now I need to fill in my numbers for my particular problem. Well, I could get X bar if I did, again, one bar stats off of L3. That will also give me SD. Right? I know N is four. I know mu sub D is zero, and that's great. I'm still gonna use my calculator and its output screen right now to help me get this, these numbers. So we're gonna go back to the mechanics that we used in chapter nine. And in chapter nine, if you remember, right, when we had a single mean t-test, and we are doing single means in that it's the paired data, we went stat test two. So I'm gonna do stat test two on my calculator. So stat test two. All right, I do have raw data, the null mean in this case is zero, right? We think the null, uh, the true difference in before minus after, if that strength development class is not working, then the difference would be zero. My data is not an L1, it's actually an L3. All right, and the coach is hoping that the strength and development class is working, so we're gonna leave it as a greater than alternate, and I'm gonna hit calculate. All right, so when I do that, all sorts of information pops up, but I want us to take a look here, right? There is my standard deviation. So that was the first thing I needed to fill in at 46.7 pounds, okay? In terms of X bar, I see it right there at 21.25. So this is 21.25 minus my null of zero in ratio to my standard error, which was 46.7 over the square root of, well, I had four players. Okay, and then it looks like that test statistic is 0.91. All right, fantastic. My p-value, so I'll go one more step down if I want my p-value. Let me scooch this up so we can all see it. All right, my p-value, according to my output screen, it's about 21%. So again, to be clear, if you wrote this on a test, you're gonna get full credit. I'm totally happy with that answer. But I wanna make sure we know how to get from step 10 to step 11 without using this particular calculator function, the t-test. I always wanna do it the long way because I will embed multiple choice questions that force you to use TCDF. So let's practice it. So every p-value is a probability, right? You owe me a letter, a symbol, and a number. So my letter is the t-distribution. Because my alternate is greater than, I've got the greater than symbol. And my test statistic was 0.91. Okay, so when I go to run this, this is gonna be tcdf, low, high, and then degrees of freedom. All right, now let's calculate that number using TCDF, so we've got low, which would have been 0 0.91, high, 1899, three degrees of freedom, and I should get something pretty close to 21%. There it is, about 
Alright, so now we're just we're solidifying that we know how to get from step 10 to step 11 with two different ways of doing it, right? We've got our calculator output screen from the t-test. Oops, you can't see it. Calculator output screen from the t-test and then we also have tcdf. Alright, let's go ahead and make a graph. I'm going to put my graph up here. I think I have enough room. Alright, so I am on the t distribution. Zero is under the peak. My test statistic is only about 0.91. It's not that large. And I should be shading about 21% of my graph. That looks pretty good. Let me just check it with my calculator uh, output or the, the draw function on there. So we'll do stat test, let's go here. Let's hit draw. Oh, I can see my box plot in there. I didn't turn my box plot off. That's why you see it spanning over that. But I see the 21%. If we don't want the box plot in the way, go ahead and turn it off and then run this again. All right, and there's going to be your test or your T distribution, three degrees of freedom, right? In there, I'm shading 21%. Okay, and I'll even put a little subscript of three just to really denote which, which graph I'm dealing with. Okay, so when we get here, we gotta decide, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna reject or are we gonna fail to reject? Well, I've got 21% here, I've got 1% here. So my p-value is larger than my alpha, which means I'm gonna fail to reject. So let's go ahead and practice writing this last part up. So here we go, because our p-value is greater than alpha, we fail to reject H naught. All right, so whenever you fail to reject H naught, and really you're just, you're saying I'm keeping the null, okay? But that means you do not have evidence for the alternate. So we do not have evidence And when you're trying to decide what you don't have evidence for, go back up to your actual alternate and to how this problem was written because there's usually clues and hints as to how you could write it up. So I could say we do not have evidence for the alternate, right? Which symbolically says mu sub d greater than zero. So you could say we do not have evidence that the true average difference in amount of weight lifted after minus before is greater than zero pounds. You could write that. But I would argue it might be easier to just do this, right? The coach wants to know if the strength development class makes this player stronger. So we do not have evidence that the strength development class makes football players stronger. All right, just regard or barf back the words I gave you. Just send them right back to me. Say, thanks for the words. I'm giving them right back to you. So we do not have evidence. Oh, let me get this into view. We do not have evidence that the strength development class makes football players stronger. Totally acceptable answer. If you wanted to, you could also say we do not have sufficient evidence Oh, I realized I left the word sufficient off here. Okay. We do not have sufficient evidence that the true average difference in amount of weight lifted And we opted to go after minus before. 
is greater than zero pounds. So that's also a completely acceptable write-up. I, I think this one's easier to write up, and I, I know when I do these, I, I have less thinking I gotta do, because I just write the words that were giving, given to me, and just write them right back. Okay, so with that, let's think of, let's try and review a couple of concepts. So first of all, what type of error might you have made? Well, whenever you fail to reject the, the null, you might have made a type two error. So let me put off to the side here, type two error, is possible. All right. Because you failed to reject the null, and maybe the alternate was true. Maybe you should have rejected it. And when the alternate's true, it's potentially a type 2 error. And then in terms of, is this data statistically significant? We talked about that vocab term back in chapter 9. And statistically significant means your data has convinced you to change your mind about something, right? It's significant enough for you to change your mind. And if we look at this, we fail to reject the null, meaning we're not changing our mind on anything. We don't think this strength and development class does anything. So this data is not statistically significant. Statistically, hold on, I can spell it, significant. When data, or excuse me, when you wind up rejecting your null, all right, when your data makes you change your mind, then you say it's statistically significant. Like it's enough for us to make us change our minds, okay? And one last thing I just wanna to touch on is let me go back through this. And let's say, even though we didn't opt it in this problem, but let's just say you had gone before minus after. If you had gone the other way on this, all right, I'll just put it in here. If you had gone before minus after, then you would have had a different alternate. Your alternate would have been less than zero. And while certain aspects of your write-up would have shifted, the end result wouldn't. So let's, let's try this. Let's pretend you had gone before minus after, okay? So let me go back into my stats and instead of doing L1 minus L2, excuse me, instead of L2 minus L1, let's go L1 minus L2. So you can see all of those numbers changed sign, right? The positive numbers became negative, the negative numbers became positive. Well, if you run your stat, your t-test, you're now going to have the less than alternate because you're subtracting in the other direction. When you hit calculate, almost everything is the same other than the signs switch, right? Your test statistic is no longer positive 0.91, it's negative 0.91. Your sample mean is no longer positive uh, 21.25, it's negative 21.25. But take note that your p-value stays the same. And the reason for that is you've just changed tails. All right, now all you're doing is getting the left tail. How did that not work? This was supposed to be the big reveal. Did I, oh, I might've hit z-test and not t-test. Okay, I don't know what happened before. You'll have to tell me what I hit, but all right, big reveal, here it is. So then you're just doing the left tail and you can see that those two pictures, ooh, I don't have them in view, hold on. Let me draw this or bring this down. These two pictures have the same area under the curve, they're just the different sides or the different tails of, of your um, T distribution, okay? So you would still get the same results, you would fail to reject the null, right? And you would say, hey, sorry coach, I don't think your strength development class is working. All right, so with that, let's try a few multiple choice. I will catch you in a bit. Bye.